Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patsala. I am Partho Pratim Bora from Department of Sociology, Dibrugo University, Assam. The title of this module is Neo Marxist Perspective Introductory Overview from the paper Contemporary Social Theory. In this module, we will give a uh, understanding of the transition that is take place in the Marxist perspective and the nature of crisis that emerged in the Marxist perspective in the post-1960 period when there was a crisis within the orthodox Marxism. So basically the neo-Marxist perspective will try to see what are the problems that were associated with the Marxian understanding or the understanding that was given by Marx and Engels which was also known as orthodox Marxism in the sense that it was basically associated with the economic determinism. And basically, the what are the crises or what are the problems associated with the orthodox Marxism in the post-1960 period, how the Althusser understanding as well as how does the development of the critical theory in the post-1960 period try to provide an alternative to the Marxian understanding. On the one hand, they were influenced by the Marxian understanding of the economic determinism, but on the other hand, they tried to relook into the question of Marxian understanding on the basis of various aspects that were taking place in the contemporary society. In such a context, the module will be basically discussing, the first part of the module will be discussing the orthodox Marxism, what are the various dimensions of Marxism, then we will try to see what are the problems that were the part of the orthodox Marxism, which were questioned by the neo marxists So in that context, we will discuss the idea of Gramsci especially in the 1920s or after the First World War, then we will go to the development of the Frankfurt School as well as we will also study the work of Althusser as a structural Marxist. Now let us discuss the idea of orthodox Marxism. So as you know, the idea of orthodox Marxism basically associated with the Marxian idea developed by the Karl Marx and his contemporary. So that was the understanding whereby they try to understand the society in terms of base superstructure model where the base is basically as associated with the economy on the other hand the superstructure is associated with the other aspect like politics, ideology, etc. This base superstructure model which is influenced by the Hegelian idea of dialectics basically talk about how there is a dialectics and how the base basically influences the superstructure and how there is a dialectics and that is basically associated with the change in the society. But what do we see over the period of time that idea of economic determinism or how the economy work as a base while all other things like politics, ideology work as a superstructure was basically questioned by the neo marxists Although they take the idea of the economy or they take the idea of the contradiction or they take the idea of the uh, dialectics, but they try to relook how they can be used in the contemporary time. We therefore begin from this crisis of the Marxism in general as a rise of orthodox Marxism. We try to define what is orthodox Marxism. Then the next crisis of Marxism is seen in the 1950 when the Althusser structural Marxism emerged as another neo Marxist response to this crisis. In the end, we will also try to give uh, how the critical theory developed in the response of the capitalist society. In the context of uh, orthodox Marxism, it is seen that the political manifestation of this orthodoxy is reflected when there is an uh, importance of reformism from socialist part. In so long as the revolution was bound to come, there was no rush to impose revolution by the proletariat on the natural course of history. The role of Communist Party of the worker to fight for the reform so that the condition of existence remain human till socialism comes and solve all the problems. It was just a wait and watch policy for this Marxist with orthodox economics deterministic view. So we can see how the orthodox Marxism failed to see the possibility of using the theory into practice by merely using the dialectical understanding in case of economic determinism, they uh, were having an abstract understanding of the base superstructure model. But 
that was not seen how that can be used in the revolutionary potential or how the theory can be uh, uh, used in the context of practice. So because of this problem, uh, it led to the emergence of Gramscian neo-Marxism, which was basically a kind of Hegelian Marxism. In the 1920, right after the First World War and the Russian Revolution, a new impetus to think Marxism afresh was evident. There were a number of intellectual and activists who protested against the caricature of the revolutionary potential of Marxism in the hand of Second International. Out of this, a particular paradigm of thinking emerged as a Hegelian school of Marxism with the three key figures, George Lucas, Karl Korsk, and Antonio Gramsci. Not necessarily, these three thinkers worked together to develop a systematic body of interpretation of Marxist method and concept. It is rather much later, scholars interested in Marxism have related their work, found a continuity, and in the process, Hegelian Marxism has emerged as a body of neo-Marxist interpretation. Now let us discuss the question of theory and practice from the Hegelian Marxism. Hegelian Marxism strongly opposes this tendency for being anti-Marxist. It is anti-Marxist because in the hand of Second International, Marxism departed from revolutionary politics and turned reformist. The great Marxist thinker and leaders were satisfied with analyzing capitalist society and theoretically showing its pitfalls, while in their practice, they were demobilizing working class by not taking revolutionary programs seriously. Hegelian Marxism see this to be the symptom of orthodox Marxism laying its stress entirely on the base. Their obsession with objective, natural law of capitalism had pushed them towards studying only this law in abstraction of theory. But what they forgot, it is not only human actor who with their consciousness action can bring the real change in the society. So Hegelian Marxism see the problem with the orthodox Marxism, especially after how the Second International uh, failed to uh, fail to see the revolutionary potential of the uh, proletariat. So in that context, they talk about how rather than having the revolutionary politics, the second international shift their work to that of reformism. And that was seen as a one of the problems that was associated with the orthodox Marxism. And in that context, the Gramsci developed the idea of Hegelian Marxism, whereby they tried to relate that theory with that of practice. It is argued that Hegelian Marxism that Marx and Engels works are itself product of this unity of theory and practice. Karl Korsk, a prominent Hegelian Marxist, put forth the view that what Marx and Engels were successful to do was the marry revolutionary practice of working class with the theoretical development of bourgeois science. Marx and Engels' writing in the early 19th century witnessed working class revolutionary action and the practical consciousness critiquing whatever was wrong with capitalism. On the other hand, bourgeois social scientists like Ricardo and Adam Smith were analyzing socio-economic system of capitalism scientifically without having critical consciousness of the working class. Marx and Engels took the theoretical advancement of Ricardo, Adam Smith, etc. and applied it with critical practical experience of the proletariat in understanding Marxism and therefore Marxism emerged as a science which can guide the action of proletariat at the same time towards the revolutionary transformation. Kors believed the development of Marxism as a praxis cannot be ignored at any cost. So we see the influence of Hegelian Marxism led to the new kind of understanding where they try to see how the theoretical understanding of Marx and Engel can be utilized for the revolutionary practice or how they can be utilized for the revolutionary practice in the society. Now let us see the idea of reified consciousness from the unity of subject and the object. So it is argued that within the Marxian thinking, the bourgeois position in the society failed to understand the nature of dialectics that exists in the society. And it is also argued that it is basically the influence of Hegelian Marxism that help us to see how it is actually the subject position or the proletariat position in the society 
that they can help them to know the dialectics that is exists in the society. So in that context, it developed the idea of a reification or that of false consciousness. How the bourgeois position failed to see the nature of dialectics or the conflict that is a part of the society. On the other hand, because of the context of the location of the proletariat, that because of the subject position of the proletariat, that they can understand the nature of conflict or the nature of dialectics that is taking place in the society. Uh, it is basically the reification or the concept of reification and false consciousness which is used to understand the unity of the subject and object. Reification explains why it is only proletariat subject position which can observe the social reality as dialectical. Reification as a concept relates to the Marx discussion of commodity fetishism in capital. Marx's contention is that in the capitalist society, every relation is transformed into exchange relation. Everything is also rendered into commodity to be exchanged, including human labor. As the scope of the commodity grows to become ubiquitous, the man starts to believe that the world of commodity is something external and independent of them. They forget that these commodities are a result of their own human interaction and labor in the economic sphere of production and the reproduction. So that was basically he was looking how the commodities that are produced by the human labor are itself seen as a kind of alienated from the human labor. So that was basically the commodity fetification, fetishism that take place in the capitalist context. So it was a, uh, everything that is including the human labor is taken as something to be uh, exchange or that is ubiquitous and in such a context it is the alienation of the product of the human labor that is the part of the uh, capitalist society. Then we can take the idea of locus who also take the idea of commodity fetishism who is must restrict in the economy to apply it in the society at large. Locus hold that capitalism reaches a stage where it actors feel every social structure not only economy is out there objectively existing independent of their subjective will. As subject and object became separated, Locas now claim that in a capitalist society, false consciousness prevails. Classes which hold a particular position in the productive system develop their own distorted view of the system. The bourgeois worldview of the capitalist system remain imprisoned under the reified consciousness treating objective reality as external. So it is because of the position that the particular class have in the capitalist society, they used to have a false consciousness. And this false consciousness is because the particular class or how they understand their class position, which is not the objective reality. So it is a kind of reified consciousness or how they see the kinds of even the case of bourgeois class or a proletariat class, how their consciousness is reified or how their consciousness is imprisoned in the particular ideology of capitalist society. Now let us discuss uh, Gramsci as a Hegelian Marxist. So in the context of unity between the subject and the object or in the context of understanding Hegelian Marxism, the significance of the Gramsci comes or the work, of, the work, or the, uh, the work that was done by the Gramsci had a significance in the context of understanding Hegelian Marxism. In the background of this centrality to Marxism as a praxis that is unity of theory and practice and unity of subject and object and subjectivism which Hegelian Marxism explicitly borrow from Hegel, Gramsci's intervention must be situated. Gramsci firmly believed that in his time around 1920, proletariats comprise the subjective agency whose collective practice is in consonance with the historical necessity of his time. He is convinced that workers would develop a culture in the broad sense of the composite expression of the dominant ideas, consciousness, common sense, guiding the humanity, and laid from the front which would counter all the regressive element in bourgeois culture. So, the need of the time and thereby a challenge for the working class was to develop a new culture which shall enable them 
to achieve a new configuration of power. This means that within Gramscian framework, introduction of a body of new intellectual work which would facilitate an understanding of relationship between politics and economic system. For this, the proletariat needs organic intellectual, who are thus not a class of intelligentsia and not with scientific temperament and analyzes the reality objectively. Because there is no such objectivity and for Gramsci, there is no such separation between the thinking and the political practice as well. This is why intellectual mass became organic, who as a part of the masses uses their language to express the feeling and thinking of the masses which later on their own cannot do at that moment. So Gramsci's idea of organic intellectual can be seen in the context of Hegelian Marxism whereby the, there was an attempt to have a connection between theory and practice. So as Gramsci argued, the role of the organic intellectual is not only to have scientific analysis, but how it can influence the working class or how it can influence the political class or in the, on, on the other hand to masses to develop their own ideology. So that is the role of the organic intellectual to have a connection with the masses in the society that was seen as a significant contribution of the Gramsci in order to have the connection between the theory and the practice. As I already mentioned, that was the kind of development that was seen in the Marxian theory because of the Hegelian influence. Now let us discuss the idea of destalinization as, as, as a next crisis and Althusser as a structural Marxism. Althusser's interpretation of Marxism has often been labeled as structural interpretation of Marxism. Althusser is believed to use structural framework made popular by the famous anthropologist Levi-Strauss in Marxism. However, this may not be entirely true because in some other writing, Althusser appeared to be highly critical of Levi-Strauss. But many continue to call this trend of neo-Marxism as structuralist or structural Marxism to point out that Althusser and his follower stress on primacy of the structure as processes in the thinking about Marxism as phrase. So in that context, we can see how the Althusser tried to use the structuralist understanding of the Levi-Strauss because Althusser tried to use the structuralist understanding of Levi-Strauss in Marxism. His understanding is also known as structural Marxist. Now let us see the idea of destalinization as a revision of the Marxism. As it was led by Althusser, a younger group of French philosophers like Etienne Belivar, Jacques Rancière, Alain Bourdieu, Nicolas Polantas, etc. began the project which would come to be denoted as structural Marxism. The school of thought was trying to respond to the subjectivism of Hegelian Marxism and economism still inherent in the political practices of communist parties. Their work would include the innovative Marxist reinterpretation of ideology, state as an institution, periodization of human society across history, on art and culture, etc. The reworking of Marxist interpretation largely depend on two conceptual development put forward by structural school. First is their understanding of history as an objective process without subject. Second, the conception of Marxist dialectics as over determinism. As we shall see, the first concept reject the Hegelian Marxist subjectivism and second refute any form of orthodox economism. Now let us discuss history without subject. Structural Marxism proposes that there is a break in the Marx own writing. While the younger Marx influenced by Hegel and German idealist philosophy is still concerned with human essence, alienation, consciousness, the matured Marx is truly scientific in trying to develop a materialist theory of history. The younger Marx wrote the economic and philosophical manuscript in 1844 and the later Marx wrote the capital. The structural school hold that the true essence of Marxism can be found in capital where he demonstrated that what he means by dialectical method and application of it in history. In contrast to this humanistic view that is 
human being is the center of all historical civilizational dynamics which is idealist because stress on human ideas and consciousness. Structural school proposes studying history as a process without a subject. What does it mean to study history without a subject? It is to study not humanity's consciousness but history as an unconscious process moving through various combinations of relations of its various structures. Now let us go to the Marxist dialectics as overdeterminism. One is justified to wonder at this point that how this view of history is any different from orthodox Marxism view of history. Orthodox Marxism reduces whole history to economy. In contrast, the major difference structural Marxism see history consists of at least four elements, ideological, theoretical, political and economic. All these elements which structural Marxists prefer to call the practices are active in shaping human history. It is not just economy. So we can see the basic difference that lies between the structural Marxists and the Marxists is how the Marxists was basically having orthodox Marxism while they would see economy as the only determinant. On the other hand, for structural Marxists, the, it is not only economy but political, ideological as well as theoretical component are also important in order to understand the dialectics. So the political, economical, ideological uh, component are important in order to understand dialectics. It is not only the economy. And in that context, the structuralist Marxists differ a lot from the orthodox Marxists. The crisis of capitalist society in general, the critical theory of Habermas. So as you know, the critical theory that was developed in the Frankfurt School in Germany was a new way or it was a kind of important contribution for the neo Marxist understanding. So critical theory basically developed in the Frankfurt in Germany and in, in that context we can see the work of uh, Max Horkheimer, Adorno and in the later phase we see how the work of Habermas play an important role in the development of the neo Marxist understanding of society. Now let us discuss how the Habermas understanding of neo-Marxism was important in such a context. The neo-Marxism of Jargon Habermas as a strand of critical theory did not emerge out of a crisis intrinsic to communist politics and Marxist philosophizing. The critical school that developed by uh, uh, Horkheimer and other and in the letter Habermas initially belonged to was a group of like-minded academician sharing common interests in the issues like knowledge, ideology, rationality or the capitalism in the age of fascism. Not all of them were Marxists in the way the Gramsci, Lucas, Korsk or Althusser were. Marxism for the school was a vibrant tradition of critical thinking. But they wanted to subject Marxism itself to their critical theory. In this backdrop, an engagement with the Marxism, Jürgen Habermas work has emerged. Now let us discuss the question of the critical theory, the subjectivism and praxis. Social science, when the critical theory was emerging in the early 1930s, followed the footsteps of natural sciences. The mainstream of social science assumed that there are facts out there in the reality. And the aim is to observe, generalize and risk laws describing such reality. The critical school reject this idea of the external and objective fact. For them, there is no fact as the object of observation and the perception out there. The fact is in reality historically conditioned. Not only that, there is no neutral observation and perception as well. The subject observation and perception is equally historically given. So it means there is a basic difference of the critical theory and the earlier social science understanding. While the earlier social science understanding tried to see the object in the line of natural science method where the object is seen as a kind of fact which is already out there which can be observed or generalized, the critical theory basically talk about the historical context of not only the subject but also the object. So that was basically the significance of the historical context that we need to keep in mind while in the study of the social science and that led to the development of the critical 
theory that basically question how we see the fact as something which is external to us or which we can observe and generalize which was basically the lineage or which was conditioned by the natural science approach was questioned by the social science approach in the critical theory by looking into the historical context. Now let us see the problem of dialectics. We have seen that in case of base superstructure debate on determining the primacy of each element, various positions have been taken in Marxism. The critical theory in which the work of Adorno comes come to oppose prevalent ideas of dialectics altogether. It is pointed out that philosophy in general, including dialectics in Hegel and Marx, has always ended up attaching primacy to one another. The critical theory venture to do away with any primacy whatsoever and keep dialectics as an open system of investigation. Its main task is to oppose any totalitarian tendency by not assigning absolute importance to any category. Now let us see how the Habermas, Habermas neo-Marxism was a kind of critical encounter with the Marx uh, as a foundation. The above mentioned social philosophical assumptions are seen that uh, the direct effect of the critical engagement that the Habermas has with the Marx needless to add the departure that the Habermas take is also the foundation of his work on the communicative action, public sphere and deliberative democracy. Marx has stressed that the main relationship with nature and the mastery over it is a real space of the sociological investigation into labor productive forces and the mode of production. And finally, superstructural form every mode of production erects. Habermas observed this to be the Marx correct attempt to move away from Hegelian idealism to the sole concentration on consciousness. The equal stress on the dialogical communicative aspect of human society in rejecting Marx's sole preference for human being interaction with the nature to satisfy this basic need is the echo of his guiding the critical theory tradition. They are also basis of Habermasian foray into discourse theory, transformation of public sphere as a site where intersubjectivity shapes up the deliberative democracy with the stress on communication and dialogue as a route ahead amid of the perils of modernity. So we basically see how the Habermas also provided a new understanding of communicative action as well as democracy, the idea of public sphere as well as how there is a possibility of the dialogue that takes place in the public sphere actually help us to know the nature of uh, new capitalist society, the, the possibility that is there in the context of development of the uh, public sphere. So he was basically criticized or he was basically critical of the capitalist society because of the rationality that was the taking place or that was dominating our society. On the other hand, today to do away with the problem of rationality, he was basically talking about the idea where there is an ideal speech situation will develop, where there will be the communication without domination. So it is a kind of, it is an idea of the public sphere where there will not be any kind of domination. So in this module that was associated with the neo-Marxian understanding or to give an introductory overview to the neo-Marxian perspective, we are trying to have introduction to the neo-Marxist perspective. Here we started with the idea of the Karl Marx and, and Engel, what is the, their idea, what, what is their basic idea and that was the, then we go to the idea of orthodox Marxism, what were the characteristics of orthodox Marxism, then how? There were some problems that were seen in the orthodox Marxism. That was the failure to see the connection between the reality and the practice. In such a context, we developed the idea of Gramsci that was developed in the after first world war and especially after the Russian revolution to see the role of the organic intellectual in society. So the role of the organic intellectual is not only to have a, only the scientific understanding, but it also associated with how they can connect with the masses. On the other hand, we also studied the work of Althusser, how the work of Althusser is significant in the context that he was basically a structural Marxist who was influenced by the work of Althusser. Althusser and how it was influenced by the work of Levi-Strauss and how he tried to use the work of Levi-Strauss who was a structuralist in the context of Marxism. So he was basically trying to combine 
a historical understanding of structuralism with that of historical understanding of Marxism. So as a result, his Althusser understanding also, also interesting to look that as a structural Marxist. In the later, last part of the module, we were discussing the work of Habermas and how his work is important in the development of critical theory. So this overview of the critical theory will help you to know the detail of the various critical theories in the uh, later modules. Thank you.